Hi everyone, it's good to be here. So today we're going to talk about detection engineering, alert fatigue, and dealing with uh, security operation centers, limited resources, and how we try to overcome that. My name is Emilio, but I've already been presented, so let's skip that part. And same goes for yep. Femi. So for the presentation, we're going to talk about our context and the problems we were trying to solve. Indicators, what they are, why they're cool, and when not to use them. We're then going to show our implementation of a platform that leverages the concept of indicators, which we call Yamaha. We're going to suggest a free and open implementation for people who want to try the concept without having to pay. And we're going to close with takeaways and the future of Yamaha. So context and problems. About our organization, we're a fairly big organization with about 50,000 employees, which means we manage lots of endpoints, both workstations and servers, more than 70,000. For the workstations, it's mostly Windows with a small amount of Mac and Linux. For the servers, we have both cloud and on-premises infrastructure with a good mix of Windows servers and Unix servers. We have an EDR installed on the vast majority of machines and a TLS inspecting corporate proxy that sends logs directly to the SIM, which means we have lots of telemetry to build detections on. For the SOC, we're a fairly big SOC with more than 20 SOC analysts slash threat hunters slash detection engineers. And we have a very heterogeneous network that carries decades of IT work at a time where security wasn't a main concern. And this is kind of important when doing detection engineering to be aware of that. So let's say you wake up today, you say, I want to build a good detection. So what are the characteristics that detection should have? First, you want no false negative. So you want to detect all malicious behavior you want to detect, but you also want no false positive. So you never want to detect a legitimate behavior. You want the detection to have a small time footprint, which means you don't want to exceed the SOC's capacity to respond to all of the alerts of that detection, which either means not many alerts, or the alerts can be investigated quite fast, or in the best world, both. You want the detection to be fully actionable, which means an analyst will know what to do to investigate and respond to that alert and can actually do it. And finally, you want the detection to be maintainable, so not bloated with exclusions and overly complex logics. So when you look at the detection, it's clear what it does. So you guessed it, a good detection is more like a perfect detection. You're never going to get a perfect detection, but you want to approach these characteristics. Small word about alert fatigue, because this is really important. Alert fatigue is a phenomenon that occurs when cybersecurity professionals become desensitized after dealing with an overwhelming number of alerts. So they start to overlook or ignore them and have slower response times. So if you work in a SOC, this is really important to understand. And if you haven't worked as an analyst dealing with a large number of alerts, which all look the same and are all false positives, it might not be obvious that this is something real, but it is, believe me. And if you build detections and you don't take into account alert fatigue, you might have a false sense of coverage or security because you said, well, my detection is built, it detects the stuff. Um, but if you don't consider that analysts have alert fatigue or, or can have alert fatigue, you might believe that if something malicious happens, it's going to get detected. Whereas if the detection is like 99.99% false positives, analysts perhaps will take mental shortcuts and ignore stuff that's actually malicious. So usually, we want to address that. And one of the main way to address alert fatigue is reducing the number of false positives. So how can we handle false positives in a SOC? The most obvious answer is add exclusion to your detection. And this is usually good. It lowers the amount of false positives. But the more exclusions you add, the higher the chance that you're going to miss something that's actually malicious, So, meaning increasing the number of false negatives. So you need to be careful. You can have a triage tier. 
And not everybody uses the term triage the same way, but for this presentation, triage means having either analysts or automations that look at alerts and close quickly uh, obvious false positives. And this is usually good to do, but we need to be careful because it actually increases the likelihood of alert fatigue for the analysts that look at the alert first. You can hire more analysts, but this costs lots of money, doesn't address alert fatigue, and in a talent and labor shortage, it's harder than ever to do. You can automate contextualization and response with a SOAR, and that helps greatly, but it requires a lot of time to do correctly and resources, and it's not a silver bullet. Some stuff is still gonna have to be done by humans, and it's okay like that. And perhaps the most common is not using the detection. For detection engineers out there, probably happen at least once. You looked at the technique, you said, well, this is so easy to detect. I'm gonna build a detection looking at process creations with that filter. You build a detection, you say, I love this detection, it's gonna fit so well in my environment. You put it to, to prod, you wait a day, and what happens? It triggers 300 times that day. And you're like, that's too much for my suck of three people to handle. I'm gonna add exclusions. And you add exclusions, and then it triggers, it's better, it triggers 30 times every day, which is still too much. So what do you end up doing? You take the detection, you cry a bit, and you throw it in the garbage, which keeps your blind spots, which means infinite false negatives. But what if there was a way of keeping that detection instead of throwing it in the garbage? So yeah, we decided to, um, to, uh, to turn to end skaters. And what are uh, the end skaters? What do we mean by end skater? It's um, the output of a detection logic, of a rule or content match, whatever you want to call it. But it's mainly the output. Uh, the main output you know is probably the alert. So there's a SOC analyst that will investigate uh, the output of this detection logic. But we added uh, one that is uh, an indicator. So what, what is an indicator? And what do we do with them? So, the feedback. All right. Um, so yeah, what do we do with them? We correlate them to uh, trigger incidents. So let's say you have a phishing attempt, like a, an indicator for a phishing attempt, but it's not uh, uh, like uh, precise enough to, uh, to get an alert for it. And then you have the same thing for a persistence uh, afterward and something else. And then you, uh, you might just tag them and build an alert for uh, the whole incident. You might also use them for additional context. So let's say you have a ticket uh, to investigate. You want to see for a, a host what else uh, has happened on the same host during the same uh, time period. Well, you can just use what uh, has already triggered um, as an indicator on the same host. You can also use them as thread hunting leads. So if you just put them like a, in a, some UI or some data store and uh, your thread hunters want to, um, to just like browse them and find the malicious stuff, well, the, that's a good one. And also, uh, you can use an entity model to uh, score the entities um, to uh, just like help the thread hunting uh, prioritize the, their leads or um, use them uh, for um, uh, Triggering, triggering alerts uh, with high scores. And you can use, do that for machines, users, uh, domains, and especially cats, because they are kind of malicious or at least suspicious. So um, yeah, what are the benefits of, uh, of using them? Well, when we don't have one detection equals one alert, we, uh, we may bypass some of the um, negative side effects of the false positives. So um, what does that mean? Uh, we can do like detection logics that we would have just thrown away like Emilio said, or um, otherwise, uh, yeah, just it would have uh, done some alert fatigue for the second list. So we can implement them. They are uh, less precise, but it's fine because they are, are not um, actioned on uh, for like in a one-to-one -one manner. Uh, it also enables us to detect suspicious stuff, but uh, not really uh, abnormal. So let's say you have a net users uh, your sysadmins do that. You, maybe your developers or somebody that knows a bit of command line might do that, but it's not malicious. But you want maybe to uh, get uh, uh, an, ins an indicator for this. For uh, if there's an incident, you might just use that as uh, to help you contextualize. 
And they often stack together to build um, some incident or a story that helps you investigate or trigger alerts. But can you put anything in these? Uh, no, uh, garbage in, gar garbage out, as they say. Um, they should be meaningful, they should be um, in tune also. If you have like a lot of false positive, you should do your exclusion and everything. Um, like something that triggers 10,000 times a day might be fine for an informational indicator. It's just like there's no scoring, it's uh, only there for contextualization, but maybe not for a high severity because you don't want to score on uh, some uh, on a lot of noise. And um, they should be an indicator of attacks. So let's say you have a process making a lot of DNS queries. Maybe Chrome is not uh, a good process for that because it's basically the the main thing that Chrome does is DNS request. Okay, so maybe you're thinking the, these are cool, I want to implement indicators, but uh, there, are ba there is basic stuff uh, to do before that. Um, well, you need a good budget, like anything in security. You need uh, security-minded developers to leverage these indicators, build platform around it, and uh, might make this um, valuable. You have basic, uh, basic stuff like proper assets and software man management. Um, the SIM, EDR, firewalls, uh, anything that the log source, basically, because you need them to build detection logics. If you don't have this, you won't build detection logic uh, uh, at all. And they have uh, built in the detections if you don't have uh, um, people to, to work on the detection logic team. So this is the basic. Then you, uh, you want people to um, just investigate those alerts. If there are alerts and nobody is there to uh, answer them, that's not good. And afterward, the detection logic team and the most critical detection before indicators, because indicators are just there to um, circumvent the blind spot you have with the, the, the critical detections. And also a challenging team maybe that can just leverage other, um, more, uh, yeah, more le to get more leverage on these, uh, these indicators. So, Let's, uh, let's go to the implementation. What, do, what do, do, did we do? So there's four blocks. There are the log sources, the enri enrichment sources, the analytic platform, which is Databricks, uh, and uh, the outputs. So first, in the log source, you want uh, a SIM. Uh, there are probably already some uh, detection logic implemented there. You can put some uh, simple indicators there and forward them to uh, the analytic platform. Um, the other uh, log management tool, the EDR, firewalls, everything. You can maybe pull directly uh, the data from uh, your analytic platform. There's also, um, oh, sorry. There's also the enrichment sources like VarusTotal uh, for domains, uh, binaries, just to get context uh, for something known. Um, top one million domains, GOIP, etc. And then there's the, uh, in the analytic platform, there's the hunting data, which is um, like, what, what are the binaries we have seen? Uh, and what are, when were they first seen? On how many, how many hosts? Uh, same for users, uh, binary uh, domains, etc. And then all of this goes into the notebook magic, uh, where the scoring and the indicator logic happens, and we all put this in a data store. And from there, we have three type of outputs. We can open directly a ticket um, into the ticketing system to get an investigation. The SOAR can pull the data and contextualize investigation uh, automatically. Or there is the Power BI for manual uh, user queries that want to explore the data. So yeah, in the notebook magic, we explored the uh, three main uh, scoring algorithm, um, the, which we, one we call uh, TF-IDF, um, which is a frequency analysis, basically. So uh, on, if there are many entities that trigger the same indicator, you get less information from the indicator, so the score is, uh, is just like lessened. And um, yeah, if it scores on the, like a, a small subset of machine, then the score just get boosted. Um, there are the uh, indicator severity that uh, we might just like Security knowledge, if uh, we want, we say this is a critical, we put, we give it a thousand point, and then a high, we give it a hundred point, and so on. Uh, this is like the simple, uh, simplest score. And then the inertia analysis, it's more like a baseline if uh, a host or an entity gets uh, like a score, it's stable for a week, and then get a spike in score, then we can just boost its score with uh, using like the, the delta. 
So yeah, so time for a demo. So. All right, so it looks like this for an analyst, and this is the main page. So this is mostly for threat hunting. So it's a Power BI uh, report with uh, many pages, a Power BI application, I think it's called. So as you can see, there is a slider here to determine the, the date range you want to examine, and uh, the data gets updated uh, quite fast. So we can see here the, the indicators that have triggered their severity, so critical, high, medium, low, and informational. And here you have, for a given date and a given computer, a score. So the score uh, Remy talked about uh, one minute ago. You can filter easily. So if you click, it's going to filter for that specific computer day. And you can see which indicator triggered for that machine. So you can go into, into the details here. For example, the command line. Power BI has a feature that's called a drill through, which is pretty interesting to go to another report uh, by passing arguments. So we can have here a better view of the given day for the given computer. And you can see the indicators that I've triggered uh, uh, with a bit more space, so it's easier uh, to threat hunt. And this uh, might be a bit confusing. This is uh, anonymized data, and uh, the indicator name are taken from the Sigma repository on GitHub. You can also drill through to show the de all the detections for that computer. So it's interesting because you have this now uh, and the slider to determine the date. And you can see how many indicators have triggered for that specific machine every day. So we can see spikes and potentially suspicious activity. And you can filter in the same way that Power BI allows. And you can see what triggered and when. But it's not only for threat hunting. As we said, we can use them to pivot from uh, ongoing investigation. So let's say we, there's a, an EDR alert that gets triggered. Uh, the analyst that looks at the alert, uh, they want to see what kind of indicators have triggered. So we have a page for that where you can input a machine and see uh, basically the same stuff that, that we've seen uh, while threat hunting. So you can see which indicators have triggered. And this might be helpful to pivot during an investigation. And uh, we actually have a, a success story with this. We had a server that, has been, uh, that had a, a web application that was compromised. And during the investigation, an EDR alert triggered. And by going into Yamaha, we had a, a small but noisy uh, indicator, which was um, a rare domain was accessed on a small amount of machines. And by looking at the domains and uh, pivoting further, we, we were able to confirm that this machine was indeed compromised. Um, and Yamaha was a key part in that. Returning to threat hunting, as we've said, we have multiple scoring algorithms. So we have multiple views for them. So this one is the TFIDF. So as Remy said, the, the more an indicator triggers, the less the score. And the more rare the indicator, the higher the score. So if you notice, those are different machines. They are scored by score, TFIDF. So different algorithms are going to give different machines. So for thread hunting, having multiple views is, re is really great for, um, for all hunting activities. We've talked about scoring machines, but uh, we're not required to look by machines. So we have a page here looking for domains. So indicators can be triggered for domains. And if we look here, we can filter for a specific domain, uh, that weird domain.windows.net. We can see that three file names triggered that uh, indicators for that specific domain. So this is EDR telemetry. So we look at uh, DNS requests, and we map it to the process creation to see uh, what's the, the file name and what's the command line. So again, very helpful to, uh, to threat hunt. We can also filter by MITRE attack tactics. So when we build our indicators, we associate them with MITRE tactics. So if we, for example, want to do a threat hunting for only defense evasion, well, we can filter that. And it's very fast with Power BI. We can filter only for specific tactics. And finally, uh, that page, which is not for investigation nor for threat hunting, it's for the detection engineers. So you can look at indicators that have triggered. 
So you can see how many indicators have triggered every day. And you can see for how many computers, for example, a given indicator has triggered. So we can see here the node process execution indicator. It has triggered for 48,000 computers, and it's a medium severity indicator. So perhaps we should add exclusions or lower the severity for that indicator because it triggers way too much. And we can filter. And as we can see, we can, we can look at how many indicators have been triggered each day. So for example, 12,000 here. And then it drops to 3, 9, 2 a day. So actually, we added an exclusion to that indicator using uh, th that page because we saw that it was way, way too noisy. So back to regularly scheduled programming. All right, so if you want to try this at home or just like not spend a huge budget on this, uh, we, uh, we just list uh, for you some uh, open and uh, free alternatives. Um, yeah, so for the job orchestration, you need something to uh, coordinate the, um, the execution of the notebooks uh, to tell which one is first, and then the, uh, like there are dependencies, uh, and when should they run. Uh, we use Data Factory. Uh, Apache Airflow is uh, more than capable of this. Um, yeah, so uh, we're, when the, the notebooks run in uh, Databricks, and Jupyter Notebook is pretty much the same uh, in the free and open world, but uh, it doesn't have a managed da data store, neither it has uh, managed clusters. You have to do uh, this by your, uh, on your own in Jupyter. Um, for the data store, we use Delta tables. Uh, it is also free and open. I just didn't put it in, the, put it, put it in there. Uh, but you can use like a PostgreSQL or a file system, whatever you want, that the uh, analytic engine can parse, uh, which, in, uh, for instance, is Apache Spark. And uh, it is also free and open. So uh, yeah, and uh, for the presentation UI, we use Power BI, as you saw. But um, I don't, I don't think there's uh, anything that matches uh, Power BI uh, in the free and open world. So you might just use Jupyter notebooks with IPython widgets and some graphing libraries, or Kibana from the Elastic Stack. Um, yeah, and you need data, uh, data source. So we use a SIM and a EDR. Uh, but in the Elastic Stack, you have also Elasticsearch and Elastic Defend that is built in, and uh, maybe Sysmon or OZD for Linux. And you should be able to get going and do some, some of this stuff. What are the takeaways and the future of it? Um, well, they are cool. It's pretty nice. Uh, we use them every day. Um, you need a good taxic and environment coverage, uh, like anything, but especially a good taxic coverage if you want to build up incident uh, from different uh, step of the kill chain or uh, something like that. You need to uh, like don't just focus on the execution or defense evasion. You need like to, to get uh, all the way uh, all the all the taxic of the malware attack. Um, it does not replace alerts. It's just for. Uh, like the blind spot you have with alerts that you cannot like just trigger every time uh, an alert you use indicator instead, but you should fall back. Uh, like it's only a fallback. Uh, you need a good maintenance, uh, like Emilio uh, just show you, uh, showed you. Um, if you don't do this, maybe node is going crazy, and then you will have like uh, 40,000 um, uh, indicators per day, and. That's not good, so you have to tune them. Your environment is changing. Your data sources are changing, so yeah. And um, many views, many uh, scoring, because some scoring are, um, just don't show up like uh, some uh, small noisy and, uh, attackers or uh, threat actor. So you need a other way to just make them pop up. The next steps, we want uh, automated alerting based on uh, like a sudden increase in score, um, let's say, uh, uh, host is behaving abnormally and it has um, like a, a spike and suspiciousness. We want to open an alert from this. We would want also an analyst feedback loop. So, um, you know, um, if there's an indicator that is not uh, quite good enough and the analyst just like, say yes or no, this is good, this is not, it labels data. We can, uh, it help us tune the indicators, but also we might just use that for automated tuning or suggestion for exclusions. And um, that would be great. Better indicators and coverage, just like any detection logic uh, stuff. And something uh, like uh, exploring a new scoring algorithm, like something something ML or machine learning. 
And I hope this has inspired you uh, for your detection logics. So thank you. Thanks. <laughs>